Hello. Hey guys. Um, so next up is Aparna Krishnakumar, from, who is a sophomore at SRM University, Chennai. And we'll be talking about delving into art and creativity with Python. I'm personally looking forward to her talk because not only do we share a first name, my name is Aparna Pandey. Um, I'm, I promise you it's a, not a very common name. <laughs> and this was not planned. Um, but we're also coffee lovers. So give it up for Aparna. <laughs> Um, okay, so welcome to um, delve into art and creativity with Python. Um, I'm really happy to be here and I'm having an amazing time so far. So uh, before I get into my talk, I'd like to introduce myself. So like Aparna said, um, I'm a sophomore studying computer science and engineering in India. And um, I work at a student-run research lab called the Next Tech Lab where I had the AI division, so a lot of my research involves artificial intelligence and image processing, computer vision. Um, I'm also a classical Bharatanatyam dancer, which is a classical Indian form. So um, art and creativity and expression is a very important part of my life. And um, the more I started to explore technology and AI, and I started to do research in computer vision, the more I wanted to integrate both of them. And I think it's an integration or an intersection that's less explored. And so the aim of today's talk is to talk about what has been done in terms of deep learning, um, especially image processing, and what can be done um, according to applications as well as architecture. So um, I'm going to start with the first circle, which is um, the libraries and the architectures and the building blocks that are used for the AI techniques, then how I can integrate creativity to create something artistic or art, and how we can take this a step further to make something impactful, um, something that maybe bridges communication gaps between uh, cultures and languages, and um, maybe even helps the world. So let's get started. Um, firstly, why Python? I mean, we're at a PyCon, right? So, um, Easy implementation, I find it really easy and um, beneficial for me to make my ideas re reality because you're not worrying about you know, missing semicolons or anything. Um, they also have really powerful image processing libraries like OpenCV and uh, PIL, which you, know, you can use on their own to generate art, but I can't really cover that because it's only 25 minutes. And um, everything's open sourced, and you have particular AI uh, frameworks like TensorFlow and Keras and PyTorch, which are built using Python. And um, like Python, they too have a very active community, and um, it's very easy to be a part of it. So um, let's start. Artificial intelligence and deep learning. Artificial intelligence is basically a branch of computer science which tries to mimic um, what humans do and how we behave and bring that to computer systems. And deep learning is a particular part of AI where, um, which is inspired by how the brain works. So um, before I start with the building blocks of this talk, um, I'd just like to talk about how we represent data. So um, like a little kid who learns by looking around him and around things, we, the AI models to learn on data, and we usually represent data um, as a matrix of training examples. Those are the different examples that we want to learn from, and features. So when I say features, I'm essentially talking about consider a house, right? So you have um, the size of the house, you have the number of stores, um, you have the number of rooms. These are all features. Um, so the most basic architecture or building block of deep learning is neural networks. And it's basically inspired by the brain. So you have an input layer, an output layer, and one or more than one hidden layers. And what happens is uh, your input undergoes a series of mathematical computations to get your output throughout the layer. So how does this happen? Um, every connection between the input, between any two layers actually, has something called a weight. And what we do is we multiply the weight with the input and add a bias term. Now, the bias term is very important because it makes sure that the data propagates through the network and it reaches the output layer. And once we do this multiplication, we pass it through something known as an activation function. An activation function, basically what it does is it introduces an element of nonlinearity to your program uh, as compared to like an algorithm like linear regression. Um, if we talk about how the learning actually happens, it's all based 
from or happens because of the cost function that we try to optimize. So um, this is code that I wrote using NumPy just you know, to get us started with how it works. So um, what we do is we initially initialize a random set of weights and we forward propagate. That is, like I said before, we multiply the weights with the input and add a bias and pass it through an activation function. Then we do something called back propagation. So you've got your predicted output and you have your actual output. What you now do is you use your cost function to measure the difference between both of them and you find an error. Suppose it's really big. So what you do is you back propagate through the layers and you find the error through each and every layers in between. And you do this over a series of iterations such that your cost function actually converges and it's minimized. Um, so this was neural networks using numerical data. Now when we talk about images, it's a little bit more complex because um, usually we represent images through pixel values and um, it's usually represented by a 3D matrix. So you have the height, the width, and the channel. The channel signifies if it's um, a black and white image or if it's an RGB image. So if it's a black and white image, there's one channel. If it's an RGB image, there are three channels, red, green, blue. Um, so what happens is, we talked about features earlier. Wait, yeah. Um, so for images, um, because every pixel value is a feature, the number of features that we have is height times width times channel. And this is extremely big, especially when we're talking about huge and um, very detailed images and a data size of, I mean, a data set of a big size. So what we want to do is we want to compress the data. We want to make it smaller. How do we do this? So there's something called a convolutional neural network, which from its name uses the principle of convolution, which is what it does is it makes the dimensions of the data smaller. So essentially, from the vast number of features, you're choosing the best ones, the ones that you think will help the model learn the best. Um, this is done using four functions. The first one, of course, convolution. So essentially, what you do with convolution is you have a given input matrix, um, like the first one, and you have a filter. You pass the filter, or you slide the filter across the input image, and for the part that's um, superimposing with the input image, you multiply every element with the element of the filter and you add all the elements together. So like um, in the example, all the nine features together are compressed into one feature. Um, max pooling is also a similar operation where you use pooling for um, reducing the dimensionality. And there are many different ways of doing this. One of them is max pooling, the other one is also average pooling. So like you can see in the pink, um, square, um, the element six is chosen because it represents the maximum value. Um, this is also done to create something known as spatial invariance. So um, what that is is, for example, when a CNN is detecting or has an input image of a cat, it doesn't matter where in the picture the cat is, it's still a cat and it needs to be identified by the model. So that's what pooling does. And the third and fourth are very similar to a normal neural network where in the third, ReLU is an example of an activation function, as said earlier, and you have a fully connected normal neural network. Now, how do we use these four things to build a proper convolutional neural network? What you do is you do repeated functions or repeated times, um, a convolution function, um, then a ReLU function, then a max pooling. Uh, again, a ReLU, then a convolution, and a max pooling. And I've only done this, I think, around twice, but um, when you're talking about very, very big uh, CNNs like Inception that's used by Google and you know VGG16, they do this many, many times so that the dimensions or your data site is really, really reduced. Um, yeah, so another really cool thing is, like I said, you do the convolution op operation many times. And the more times you do it, the more detailed or the more advanced the features are that the network picks up. So um, again, if we talk about a house, when we do convolution once, the network may identify just the edges. And when you reach maybe the fourth layer, it's identified the windows and maybe the texture of the roof and um, so on. Okay, so uh, now that we're done with um, the building blocks, let's look into the creative applications, right? Um, in around 2016, um, the Tate had an exhibition called Recognition. Did anybody actually go to this? I would be interested. You did? Okay. So um, for those of you who didn't, it's here. So um, what this does is it uses convolutional neural networks to identify, let's take um, an image from the archive of the Tate. 
and it identifies um, features again. Like for example, of the ladies, it's identifying that it's a party and um, that there are two ladies dressed up. And um, what it does is, um, Reuters is essentially a photo journal, so they have photography. So based on what it's identified from uh, the archive of the Tate, it gives you the same recommendations based on what is in the Reuters gallery too. Um, let's move on to another application or another creative application of convolutional neural nets. So this is something that I overuse a lot and um, it's in the name, so it's style transfer. So you have the content of one image, which is the Guns N' Roses uh, band, and then you have the style of another and you're transferring the style of one image onto the content of another. And you get that output, which I made. And um, how does this work? So like I said before, um, everything is based around a loss function. Previously we had one, now we have three. So um, you have noise, which is initially again a random initialization of pixel values. And what we do is we use weights to again minimize three cost functions and we get an output. So the entire concept of this is that the property of the content and the style of an image can be separated and can be represented mathematically. So you have the content function, cost function, which basically is the mean square error between um, the generated image and the actual output image or the actual content image. And this is usually calculated for um, the fourth convolution layer because like I said before, that's when the really advanced or the specified details are captured by the continent. And then you have another one called the style layer. Um, there's something called a gram matrix and I would you know, love to go into the math of it but we don't have time. But essentially what it does is for every output of the convolutional layer, so for each convolution function, it kind of calculates a similarity measures because that's what style is. It's a sort of correlation if you want to represent it mathematically. So you have these two cost functions, a content and a style. How do you bring them together into one? So the final cost function at the bottom is basically using two ratios, alpha and beta. So you have alpha times the content loss function plus beta times the style loss function. And um, yeah, this is the algorithm. And there's many ways to experiment with this and you know, a lot of future research if you wanna do. So one is style on style. Um, there was, there's an artist on Twitter who does this or he did this before, where both this content and the style images were essentially his paintings. They were both styles and they weren't content. So he tried to experiment and see what that would output. Um, another thing you could do is you could use genetic algorithms to maybe um, get the hyperparameters that you need in terms of like alpha and beta that you want to measure. Um, maybe even use, instead of using the con4 as per the paper, you could use the con2 function or the second one earlier on if you want to create maybe a more abstract art. And um, you could use other types of pooling like average pooling or max pooling. So I talked about um, creating art and then I talked about how we can use it in the real world. So like I said before, I'm a Bharatanatyam dancer. So for me, one of um, the hardest things is um, making the audience understand my art. And um, Bharatanatyam is very dramatic. You have one character who portrays many roles and the audience is often really, really confused about you know, which character she's portraying. So what I um, thought of doing is essentially showing the change of emotion with style transfer. So every time using OpenCV, a change of emotion was detected on the dancer's face, I added um, neural style transfer to highlight the change of character. So if I can play it, this, um, okay, wait, oops. Um, context, it's basically about um, kid A who's throwing sand at kid B and then the dancer changes into kid B and is shocked. So how do we show that progression? Um, so that's kid A and there's a change of character. Okay. Um, so another application of style transfer that I did was to create personalized greeting cards. Um, a lot of people like customizing their greeting cards for Christmas, maybe putting like a picture of the family, but how do you make it more festival appropriate? So we thought of again using style transfer of maybe transferring the style of a snowy picture onto the content of your family photo. And we also generated um, the text using an AI machine, an LSTM, but again, different talk. So this is all for style transfer. Now, 
we're going to talk about Deep Dream, which is one of the coolest applications of AI in art, because usually when you, when you talk to AI practitioners and machine learning practitioners, they're all against bias. They, they don't want bias near their model. But the cool thing about Deep Dream is that it actually likes bias, and um, it encourages it. The other really cool thing about Deep Dream is people are always talking about how AI is a black box, but Deep Dream demonstrate, demonstrates what it actually thinks. So um, Deep Dream is essentially a special architecture of a convolutional neural network, wherein you want to emphasize certain biases in the given inputted picture. For example, of um, the animal with the antlers, it passes through the Deep Dream algorithm, and as you can see, the characteristics of the antlers is you know, repeatedly showcasted on the output image. So how does this work? What happens is, um, for a given layer of the convolutional network, it detects features. And um, imagine that someone takes a snapshot of the picture generated at the end of a single layer. And you feed this as the input to the next layer. So what has happened is, um, at first, um, the first layer has detected, OK, so the most important feature in that object is antlers. And then it takes a snapshot of this picture and feeds it again as an input. So the presence of an antler in the picture is repeatedly emphasized over iterations of the output. And that's how you get something so loud as that. Um, so this is when you have a neural network that's trained on um, particular images. The other type, the one in purple, is when you initialize your CNN with noise, that is random pixel values, and you train it over an architecture that's probably trained on another object or some, something different. So in this case, I'm guessing it was buildings. So um, the CNN just had random noise fed into it, and it was able to generate um, this using just noise. So again, how is this applied to the real world? So um, how many of you guys like foster the people? OK. So um, uh, the, in one of their music videos for doing it for the money, they used DeepMind to demonstrate that you know, even computers can think. Or dream, sorry. Um, that was where um, transfer learning was used, where in one particular, the given CNN was trained on dogs, hence the characteristic imagery that was produced. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, previously we talked about style transfer, then we talked about deep dreaming, right? We still haven't talked about how AI can generate images from scratch, and that's where GANs comes into play. So GANs are generative adversarial networks, and they essentially produce images like never seen before from scratch. So I don't, again, have time to go into the code, but um, I'm just going to explain this with a very simple example. So um, take Generator, who is boy G, and he wants to enter a club, but he's not cool enough. And um, the discriminator doesn't think he's cool enough. So what does he do? He keeps changing himself, like puts on a disguise, maybe puts on like a leather jacket to make himself look cooler until he looks cool enough to fool the generator, sorry, the discriminator. So um, this is the same concept that's essentially used in GANs. You have an entire training set, which is um, the training data, and you have a generator, which is random noise, and a discriminator, which is again a loss function. So the you again keep changing the weights as per the given loss functions until the generator generates something that resembles the training data. And if it's able to fool the discriminator that what's generated is in fact part of the data set of the training data, it succeeded. Um, yeah, so this is an example of things that GANs produced in the past. Every face that you can see above is fake. So there's no human that actually looks like that. And uh, I know of a startup in India that actually uses this for ads. Um, so they don't really use models, but they use GANs to generate fake um, faces. So you know, it really cuts marketing costs. You know, and um, 
The last one is uh, wherein it's basically coloring, essentially, wherein the input is an outline, and um, yeah, uh, it basically colors in based on GANs because um, the input is the generator, and um, the ground truth is the input data. And um, I actually use this, again, culture, right? So uh, in India, we have something known as rangolis, which is essentially floor art. So um, when we have festivals like Diwali or Holi, we like to celebrate and we like to draw art on the floor. So um, I'm currently working on a project with GANs, wherein we um, generate rangolis using GANs, and we pass this through a chalk pot, which basically draws the outline of the rangoli for you, because as you can see, they're very symmetrical. Um, images, so it's very hard to get the symmetry right, and then the, we can color in um, the rangolis later, which is much more fun. Um, also, when we talk about art, we should, um, I strongly believe we should also give back to the community, so um, ignore the name, but um, I'm working on, um, I'm actually a part of um, Hope India, which is an NGO, where in, in India we don't, um, a lot of children don't have um, the opportunity to go to school or to be educated. And um, there's a foundation called Hope, which not only contributes to education, but also sanitation and healthcare and food. And um, I'm currently working on a campaign with them called, called um, Coded Couture. And I really wanted to show you guys the designs, but apparently that's not allowed um, until the campaign actually kicks off. So um, I've used everything I've talked about in this talk, style transfer, um, creative coding, GANs. And I'd also like to say this is a really good example of augmented intelligence which is where um, AI and humans work together and don't replace each other because I generate the patterns and a friend of mine uses Photoshop to tweak them or shape them and make them into designs. Um, yeah, so why should this intersection of creativity, art, culture, and deep learning be explored further? So like I said, evolution. I mean, one of the reasons we're here and we've evolved so far or um, even civilization is because we were able to be creative, we were able to think. and. Um, I honestly think that technology and AI allows us to make our ideas a reality. And um, like I said, there's a lot of research to be done in terms of applications, new applications, architectures. You can experiment with architectures, maybe not only stick with comnets, use something else, um, and apply them to solve socioeconomic problems. So um, like, you know, Pearl from the morning, um, there's more than one way to do it. And um, I really like to, talk to you over coffee or discuss more ways to you know collaborate anytime so thank you